Now let's get started. Please welcome the producer of tonight's event who's working in our newsroom here on a series of special projects related to race in New York City, Rebecca Carroll. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks, y'all look so good. So a couple of program notes. Um, due to a family emergency, Nicole Hannah-Jones was unable to make it tonight. We're sorry that she is not here. Uh, another panelist, Matt zoller Seitz, is stuck in traffic, and so if he gets here, we will shuttle him in after we start. Um, in the place of Nicole Hanna is Wade Davis. Um, so let me just say that we arrived at this event ostensibly because of two New York City schools in particular. Uh, PS8, which is in Brooklyn Heights, and PS307, which is in nearby Vinegar Hill. So PS8 is overcrowded and 307 has room to spare. So this prompted a proposal to rezone and send the spillover of students from PSA to 307, which makes sense, right? Well, you know what doesn't make sense, really ever makes sense, is a conversation about race, anything that involves race. <clears throat> PSA is mostly white and affluent. PS 307 is mostly lower income, black and Hispanic. And while we can argue test scores and attendance issues all day, the notable pushback from both sides in response to the zoning proposal merely underscores the fact that New York has the most segregated school system in the country. Because I'm a writer and also a Brooklyn parent, I wanted to, before we introduce a, a host and panelist, I wanted to share an excerpt from a piece I actually wrote five years ago when I was looking for a kindergarten for my son. While most parents seek a school that satisfies traditional criteria, such as high test scores and general academic achievement, I had an additional standard in mind as we explored two dozen schools. I wanted to find a school for my son where he would have peers and mentors who are black. I was not at all prepared for the feelings of futility this pursuit entailed. My search wound up being an up-close tour of inequality and racial polarity. For our family, the stakes were high. I was adopted into a white family and grew up in rural New Hampshire, where I was the only black kid from first through 12th grade. I waited my whole life to move to New York so that I could raise my family in the most diverse city in the country. But the New York City I encountered as a mother visiting public schools was a far different place than the city I had imagined as a teenager. Schools in attractive neighborhoods were predominantly white with a smattering of black, Asian, and Hispanic students. And schools in less desirable neighborhoods were essentially all black or all Hispanic. I was looking for racial diversity and what I was finding was racial segregation. We ultimately enrolled my son at our neighborhood public school that had until the previous year served a predominantly Puerto Rican and Dominican community that now suddenly felt steamrolled by incoming white residents in the Brooklyn neighborhood of Williamsburg. When my son started there, the tension remained palpable in the K-6 through school, which was mostly Hispanic with a few black students sprinkled throughout the upper grades. His class was half Hispanic and half white, and him. I started to feel like a racial zealot on the playground. During the typical ongoing conversations with parents about whether we'd keep our kids there or not, I was always the lone parent to bring up the fact that there were almost no black kids at the school. One white parent responded one time with an honesty that I actually found heartening. Yeah, I guess the racial makeup doesn't really occur to me because it kind of doesn't have to. So I kept looking. I finally found a public school in Brooklyn, out of our zone, that appeared to be more diverse than any other public school I'd come across. When I visited, the kids were loud and attentive and easy with themselves. One teacher wore a burqa, another wore dreadlocks. Students ranged in hue and the halls smelled of construction paper. It felt alive and real and, however delusional, like the New York City I had imagined for my own child to grow up in. We need to remember, oh, sorry. And let me tell you why that matters, actually. I don't know where I put that. In any event, we need to, let me tell you why that matters. It matters because there is a vigorous beauty in being at ease with one's blackness. And tonight I would add to that. There is a vigorous beauty in being at ease with the blackness of others, the religion, culture, ethnicity, and gender of others. And it's a vigorous beauty that creates a mind that wants to learn. So I want to remind people of that as we are listening to the conversation tonight, um, and also remind us that we are raising a new generation for whom we should provide the space and the infrastructure to create a more um, inclusive, tolerant, racially conversant, culturally conversant generation. So 
Please keep that in mind as you listen tonight. First to this audio called together from pieces reported by WMYC education reporters Yasmin Khan and Beth Fertig, who may or may not be here, woo! <laughs> under the very wise editorial direction of Education and News Editor Patricia Willens for this overarching series we call Power Lines, Race, Class, a City and Its Schools. Take a listen. When I was a kid, we used to go to our, that was our beach. We used to go swimming in the river. Having black people in places is a different issue than addressing equality of resources between communities. Let me give you an example. Look there, you see that light? Those lights were never put here till the number of white people increased. Now, what do people in Farragut think about that? They understand the message. The message is, all lives matter, but some more than others. If they're with each other, they're gonna be vibrant and loving towards one another because they're gonna know each other. But it's also a way of kind of curbing some of the really destructive like, power and kind of destructive feelings and forces of gentrification. His message of equality and ending this tale of two cities resonated with me as a lifetime New Yorker. The fact is a lot of poor people in lower socioeconomic levels in, in Brooklyn, uh, they are people of color, you know? And so I know you can like pussyfoot around, uh, no, we're, we're trying, you know, we're trying to, but you know, yeah, we need more people of color in the school. Students from predominantly white schools, for example, tend to get more resources and have better opportunities than students from predominantly schools of color. This means our education is being affected, which is not something that can be ignored. Please join me in welcoming our panelists and moderator, none of whom are experts by design. This is not a conversation just about schools, but about culture. Wade Davis. Hamilton Harris. Collier Meyerson. And the rock star moderator, Stacey Enchin, who is here with us pre-curtain for her one-woman show currently in previews, Motherstruck. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's nice in here. Like, let's see, how diverse is our audience tonight <laughs> as we talk about diversity and power and race and lines and all of that? Uh, I think it's all on stage. <laughs> <laughs> So I want to start, you know, kind of by asking about our panelists, uh, where exactly do you enter this conversation about New York City, about like where you live, and we'll kind of get into education a little bit later, but where do you hail from and where do you live? I'll go first. Sure. Um, I'm Wade Davis. Um, I'm a Southerner. I grew up in rural Louisiana in Shreveport. Um, I transferred from Shreveport to Colorado when my mother got re remarried, so then I went from rural Louisiana to all-white Colorado, which was an interesting um, kind of transition. I went to college in Utah on a football scholarship. Um, I played in the NFL for a couple of years. Um, I moved to New York 10 years ago. I've lived on the Upper East Side and the Upper West Side. Hamilton, Hamilton. He has nothing to do with the play, but you know, people say <laughs> it to him all the time. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Hamilton Harris, um, born and raised here in New York City. Um, I was born in the Bronx, raised mostly in Harlem, um, and uh, I currently live now in the uh, Netherlands since 2012, and I'm here in New York visiting. Uh, my name is Collier Meyerson. I'm a reporter with Fusion. Um, I think that my experience growing up on the Upper West Side of, of New York um, really encapsulates um, and captures the problem that New Yorkers are facing right now on both sides of the spectrum. Um, I am biracial, my, my father is white and Jewish, my mother is black, and both of them have uh, college degrees and graduate degrees. Um, and I first went to a public school that was uh, black and Latino. It was predominantly black and Latino. Um, in fact, my class, which was a uh, bilingual Spanish English class um, had one white person in it so I didn't even know white people <laughs> until later on um, you know them now I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then for middle school and it was really important that my to my parents to send me to PS 75 which is where I went on the Upper West Side instead of the uh, predominantly white school just 10 blocks down, uh, PS 87, because my father had this idea that um, all education should be equal. I mean, it was very idealistic um, coming from the civil rights movement. 
and he's a civil rights attorney. Mm. Um, and uh, so my parents sent me to the school, and my uh, I suffered academically because of it. Um, and so for middle school, they they kind of changed course, mm-hmm. and they were like, okay, let's go to a more diverse school. Um, so then, what I, does more diverse mean actually? So I guess the technical definition that we're working with now is. Um, 20%, if the school is 20% white, then that means it's, a, it's an integrated school. If it's 99 to 100% black and Latino, that means it's a, a apartheid school. Um, so I went to a more integrated school. It's interesting how whiteness is the bar again, right? Yeah. It's, it begins. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, and even there in that space, it was just maybe 20% white. I don't even think it was. Um, we didn't have... Paper. My dad was always donating paper. Um, my textbook, my history textbook, still had the USSR um, mm. listed um, instead of Russia in a map. <laughs> Where do you live now? I live in Crown Heights. And then after that, my parents sent me to private school. So they sort of started on one end of the, se- of the spectrum and, and ended up on the other. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I, be, I, I, I come from, I hail from Jamaica. I was born in Jamaica, went to schools in Jamaica. And certainly the conversations we've been having around, you know, race, mostly in, 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 this, um, in this country, the conversation is steeped in the conversation around class in Jamaica because it's a more homogenous society, like, you know, 90%, maybe more than that of the population is black. And so I was born and maybe grew up in what is considered the lower economic stratum. And then I moved across. I worked very hard and got a scholarship and went to uh, high school with uh, the kids who were not necessarily uh, from the working class. And that's kind of how I got out. You know, I, I, I won a scholarship to, 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 to high school and then went to university. I came here. I never actually had any interest or, um, you know, outside of my activist uh, 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 life, I didn't really have any 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 real uh, interest in the conversation around school, any kind of you know laser interest. And then I had a kid, and so the kid, and for the first three years, I was like, yeah, it's great, you know, she's <laughs> drooling, she's like pooping, everything's great. And then she turned four, she's about to be four, and then the conversation around school became very, very, very interesting to me. I know Hamilton, you have kids as well, and you were talking about what it was like to, uh, to, to, to begin the conversation about school in, Netherland, in the Netherlands and, and how it was different here. Uh, how do you find, uh, do you find that, you know, it, it, any other conversation is similar in, in, in the Netherlands? It's a, for me, it's, 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 it's shocking, but, you know, when I grew up, uh, growing up in the 70s and, and in the 80s, um, and going to public school, you, you, only, you only saw the people in your neighborhood, in your school, you know? So the, the people who were predominantly um, and the people that were predominantly in my neighborhood looked like me. So, but we had teachers who didn't look like me, mm-hmm. you know? And th- the, the level of respect that was ushered from the teachers, and I think their awareness of, of the community that they were in and the structure of race and class within the country and within the city at the time, there was this, I don't know, there was this type of, this sort of balance that I felt that was genuine, but as I got older, um, I started to notice that there was this, this, I don't want to say injustice, but it just was imbalanced, you know? And In- then, injustice uh, as a word works when we're talking about race. It, yeah, it, it works, you know? <laughs> um, but it's interesting because the, the school, the public school system that I remember, it was deteriorating as I was evolving in my uh, adolescent years and just mm-hmm. going through public school. And to now be living in the Netherlands since 2012 and having two sons, who one of them who went to uh, public school here before leaving, and it was a charter school, but the primary school is, the, the educational level is Dalton, which Dalton here is about 36 grand. And it's like, it's 2016 in like a few weeks, and we're still dealing with, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's traumatic in ways, you know, mm. and having children and, 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 and knowing that they have to uh, 
at, at hopefully at at some some point in their evolution, they'll get to where they can overcome these issues. Hopefully, we're able to uh, create that change that'll create a, a smooth transition because it's still not smooth after. I, I certainly um, understand that feeling of, um, you know, I feel like I'm failing my kid by not having that $30,000 to send her to the school that I think would be better for her and get, give her, you know, you know, fists in the air and be strong and like talk about gender in a way that makes sense. and. Uh, but, the, you know, I, I talk to a lot of people who went to private school who say, you know, you can go to private school, but, you know, black kids suffer in a, a very different way. And I've moved across the country and talked to young people who are in uh, mostly liberal arts kind of white colleges and there's a kind of suffering that they talk about, about not being in a place where they are themselves. I want to widen the conversation outside of the schools because the school is really just a re reflection of what happens in a society, right? Do we agree? Yeah, I mean, like nothing is going on. Like, it's not like, okay, the schools are like, um, I can't say what I'm thinking in my head because this is like public. Uh, but, but, you know, the, it's not like the schools are, are, are terrible, but then the society is like great, you know. Um, you know, the, 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 what's happening with black bodies and, and, and the, the, um, the law is certainly not divorced from what's happening in our schools and where, who ends up for school or not. I, I want to ask you, Wade, you, ca you moved from down south and, and now you're, you're up north. I hear people talk about, um, you know, the south is so segregated, the south is so, the south is so, the south is so. <laughs> Everyone knows that, you know, what went down in the south, right? We have it in history. We have like this guy called um, Martin Luther King who talked about it. We, you know, we know what hap was happening in the South. And so New York has this uh, reputation of being the place where people go to find equality. I mean, I ran away from Jamaica because, you know, it's illegal to be gay there because I hear it's not illegal to be gay in New York. You know, I didn't move to Alabama because I figured maybe it's sort of illegal <laughs> there too. But so I figure New York is this like amazing place where you land. So talk to me about the move from the south to the north. I mean, are we, are we, are we, are, are we more evolved up here? Talk to me about that, Wade. I would say that New Yorkers are less blunt and less honest about how they feel. Um, so when, when I moved from the south here, I, th I remember my first, I lived on the Upper East Side, and I remember seeing all of these black women with white babies. And I come home and I was like, wow, like there's, there's, there's a lot of interracial dating around here, you know? <laughs> and my best friend was like, oh, those were nannies. And I was mm. like, oh, because I'd never seen a nanny before in my whole, I, I thought it was like this myth that it only happens on television. And then, you know, like, and then you, you go to work in the daytime and New York is very integrated. But then at night, it's not at all, you know, and that's the myth of New York City. Right well, you know, I, I came, when I came to um, New York, I, I don't know, like there's this, this whole nanny situation, you know, I, 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 I uh, this raises the conversation around gentrification. You know, I moved to Crown Heights because I could get a huge one bedroom with like a uh, huge lights and windows and wood floors and it seemed so great and like you know I remember when I moved in and I said to my neighbor oh you know I, you know this place is only $900 and she 40 years living in the building an old woman from Trinidad she's like what $900 you're paying $900 for this place that's crazy and I thought oh my god she doesn't know how great you know it is to pay $900 <laughs> exactly. for this place and now uh, 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 that apartment in my building is creeping towards $2,000, 2500 mm -hmm. And now I'm stretching to afford that apartment for myself and my kid. Uh, so uh, I want to raise the conversation about those of us who begin the conversation by being gentrifiers. Like, so that my $900 apartment 10, 15 years ago in Crown Heights, I was kind of like the fa first wave of gentrification that came in. You know, uh, and then now it's kind of happening in this way. And which, you know, I, I look in my park in Broward Park, those of us who live in Crown Heights, it used to be the park that, you know, when you take your friend's kid over there, you hold the, kid, the kid's hands really tight because there's some stuff that's going on over there with the pit bulls and the, you know, all the things that are happening in the park that you don't want your kid to be uh, exposed to. And now when I walk to the park, there are more nannies with white kids there. I mean, there's almost no kid who's black and they're. Uh, by, the, by themselves. I think the scary thing about a gentrification is just what happens before the gentrification, right? It, it's like there's this stripping of resources, there's the allowing a community to decay, 
to the point where other people can come in and actually. Um, so you think it's deliberate? You don't think that it kind of happens because you know, like creates the you policy. know, us black folk don't really take care of the place, well, and it just goes to policy ruin. matters, right? So there is there is someone who makes who creates policy, right? That that says we're not gonna have the streets cleaned as as often. There's there's someone who makes policy that actually says we're not gonna monitor the condition of the air there, right? And then. The, the racial makeup changes and then the streets become cleaned a, a lot more. There's no longer check cash in places, right? Because a check cash in place is a form of predatory lending. Like, like that's what that actually is, right? So you can go in, in certain areas and there's a liquor store, a check cash in place and a church. Bail bonds. Yes, and, and that's on every corner. And then you, you go out in, in other neighbor, neighborhoods and that doesn't exist. And then when the racial makeup changes, the check cash in place happens to disappear and there's no, and, and there's no more Popeye's chicken. Right, and there, there's like food gardens there and these other things that happen. Why weren't they there before? Someone made an actual policy decision to ensure that that doesn't happen. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Hamilton and Collier, I want to ask you, um, where do you think these, these, these bodies that are being pushed out of these neighborhoods, where are they going? Like, <laughs> I, I always wonder, sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night and I wonder, like, where? Where, where are they going? Like, you know. That's an interesting are they going to the Netherlands? Do you see them there? <laughs> I'm the only one where I'm at, that's for sure. Um, but what's, it's, that's really interesting because I think about it all the time, being back here in New York and being born and raised in New York and seeing where uh, the city has transitioned. And in many ways, it's transitioned in, in, in a if we reflect, you know, 50 years from now, it, it, it's changed tremendously. But that change still doesn't benefit the whole. And it's like, to, to me, being back in New York, to be honest, it's corny here. I don't, I, I, it feels lame. It feels, the, 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 I mean, the energy is always like high powered, but the way we use it um, collectively is just corny. It's the, like the arts, like, you, 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 like who can afford to uh, be an artist? Like who can afford to, to, to share the creative aspect on a human experience to share it? Like you, you, need, you need like six months in advance for that $900, which is now $2,400 apartment. How can and a, a, broker, a broker's fee. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's, it's taking away the, um, that, 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 that. And good credit, too. You better have good Yeah, you better have that, you know. But it's taking away that, that. That, that those high aspirations and those ideals that people come to New York, they come here for, but it's like you have to buy that. So it's like the culture now is being purchased. If you can't afford the culture, you can't be a part of it, mm -hmm. bottom line. And, it's, and it, it does suck that, you know, uh, in America um, that, you know, it's been the idea that white people have money or have resources and mm -hmm. they could buy the culture. And that's really, that's still that segregation being issued into this, supposed to be this new generation, mm. which, yeah. Carly, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I want to ask you, do, oh. do you think Trump has anything to do with, Trump in terms of the larger conversation, you know, because Trump is an issue. It's a phenomenon, right? You can't, you can't just say, we're not talking about him, we're talking about the phenomenon that allows him to, you know, stand up straight and spread his wings and fly in a place like America. So I want to ask you, um, do you think that what's going on with Trump has any connection to do with what's happening in terms of power and race and class? Certainly, yeah. I mean, I think that, that Trump supporters who tend to be um, mostly evangelical, white, um, also the Republican base, um, are in and bear with me here, um, sort of reflect in a way there's a lot of similarities between them and the white affluent um, Brooklyn Heights Dumbo residents um, who don't want to give up their privilege You're and also get yourself, um, their power. I think that, um, <laughs> I think that there's, there's a strong sentiment among Trump supporters that and a fear of um, relinquishing power and and with that opportunity. And so I think that white parents, white affluent parents, and not only white affluent parents, but parents of color who are um, also living in these communities um, don't want to relinquish um, some of that, that power. Uh, so yeah, I think that, that they're really analogous. Um, 
when you asked where these people are going, mm -hmm. where, the, where the people of color who are getting pushed out of their communities are going, it made me think, um, you know, we are all have like a certain amount of privilege on this stage, obviously, like we got asked to come talk here, even though we're all of color. Um, and I think that the communities that people of color who are getting pushed out of, um, people of color who are getting pushed out of their communities are, are still going to places in New York um, that aren't visible to us. Uh, like there's a, there's a neighborhood in the Bronx that is like the poorest zip code in the country, you know? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I think that we just aren't ourselves looking at, at those communities that they're getting pushed out of into. And that's intentional. For mm. sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, too, what's interesting is because I was in those neighborhoods, uh, I was in that, th those type of neighborhoods Thanksgiving because I have family still in New York who live still in these neighborhoods, these neighborhoods that I grew up in. And it's just a matter of time before the, the, uh, um, uh, like the South Bronx is slowly gentrifying. The Bronx is huge. So it's just a matter so of... So it's just a what matter about the of people, time. What about the people who say that as a city grows and it changes, then it attracts different people and it's kind, a kind of natural movement? Uh, you know, you just have people come in and then, you know, it's natural for me to move in my Crown Heights apartment and then it's natural for other people to find it interesting. Like, uh, you know, is there a responsibility that we, we, we have... Uh, to, 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 to take care of, uh, I don't know, is it, like, you, people say it's like a natural thing, like, how do, you, how do you respond to that, that, you know, neighborhoods change, they get better, and they get more expensive, and people who can pay come in, and it, it's not a, it's, it, it, you know, it's not some kind of deliberate, sinister plan, but a kind of natural thing that happens as a city evolves. It is, it is natural, but the way we interact with each other, the different uh, cultures and communities or so if I moved into a um, a neighborhood if I moved into you know an all white neighborhood I'm not going there trying to change that neighborhood or trying to I'm, I, I would like to learn and be a part of that neighborhood and bring whatever uh, 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 you know cultural things that I've learned during my evolution in my life into that neighborhood and add on to that neighborhood and vice versa. But that's not happening. The adding on isn't happening in Bed-Stuy. The adding on isn't happening, it, it didn't happen in uh, uh, Fort Greene. You're saying it's a kind of replacement. Exactly. It's plunder. Yeah, I exactly. So, the, and, and that, that, that keeps segregation and that keeps that ideal of separation through class and through education and through uh, eco-social structures that keeps it alive. And that's the, that's the issue that we're facing all across the board. Yeah. I, go um, I've been thinking a lot today in, in, um, before ahead of this uh, panel about the idea of personal responsibility. Um, and I was thinking about, naturally, this, this fight that's going on in Brooklyn um, and what it means to be part of the hegemon, like what it means to be part of the ruling class. Um, and how easy, like sometimes, you know, growing up in a family where my father's white and my mother's black, sometimes my mom, and, and dude has been a civil rights attorney for like 40 years, you know what I'm saying? Like he knows his way around the black block. Like, <laughs> um, but sometimes my, not sometimes, like once a day, my mom will look at him and be like, that was racist, or like, dog, please, like, <laughs> stop. Um, but a lot of these families don't have my mom, like don't have my mom in the room to say, dog, like, please, like check your privilege or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that to be like blithely ignorant um, is something we probably all do, but especially when you're in a, in a um, when you are like the like white, like 1%, 10%, whatever you are. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think that it's really important for us to um, consider personal responsibility, but we have to but figure beyond, out ways to. And I think it. I think it's like elementary, right? Beyond, you have to tell people beyond in the consideration of it. Like, uh, you know, I think most of us, especially those of us who live in the kind of like whether it's the it's the kind of well-to-do of color 
liberal spaces or white liberal spaces that I find that, you know, lots of people consider things. They consider race, they consider class, they consider uh, all kinds of things. But what should we do? People who are paralyzed, you know, I, I want to, you know, I have to leave in like five minutes because I'm on stage in like 25 minutes. So, uh, and I have to get in costume and all that. So, uh, I, I want to ask you, what, what, are, what are we to do? Like, what is to be done? For the... You know? Apart from talking about it on panels among people yeah. who, for whom it is not like that critical. So the one thing that the people who have power can do, and I said on a panel in Detroit, and I said by a developer who developed an area, you know, and raised the prices of it all. And I, and I asked him, I said, what happened to the people who were gone? And he said, well, I don't know. I said, well, what would it have looked like if you created a management trainee program, if you built in a certain amount of dollars, right, maybe two, 200 grand, for the people who live there, have first right of refusal for any new developments that you build, any jobs, any models, any Victoria's Secrets, like they can actually be the managers of those those places. You now you've trained them; they they have really tangible job job skills, and they're not just the front line; they're actually running that actual place. Like that's how you transform an individual's family, right? Um, and then like that's how you actually make it a somewhat of an exchange, right? Not just an actual way of plunder and that's an easy fix for me to put something else into my line, you know, as I'm trying to build this new community. So if you look at what happened in, in the Barclays Center, right? Like, there's all these new businesses there. The people who used to live there should be managing and running those actual businesses because you plundered them, right? That's a way to actually do some actual real change for those actual people. But no one thinks about that because, you know what? They don't have to. Mm. You know, I suppose we should make them. I got to run. But, you know, <laughs> if you come to the theater, 45 Bleecker, and tell them that you are here today, they'll give you a 10% discount just because you say you were at the green space when, and you are robbed of like 20 minutes. <laughs> Peace, love, and hair grease. <laughs> I'm the new Stacey Ann. <laughs> <laughs> Um, what a delightful thing to be. Um, so I want to, before we open up the floor uh, for questions, I wanted to go back to something you said, Collier, about going to, starting at a, a mostly black school and how your dad had this in mind, you know, that this would be a good way to start. And we had a story on, the, on, the, on WMIC this morning about what makes a good school. Um, and people who, the community around 307 thinks it's a really wonderful school. Um, and the folks I know who have kids there think it's a wonderful school, and yet the perception of it because of the test scores and because of the attendance is that it's a bad school. But you said that when you went to predominantly black schools, you're ed you suffered for from it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's about resources and um, teachers, right? So predominantly white schools tend to have uh, more experienced teachers and more resources. They just have more money. They're able to raise more money. Um, and predominantly black and Latino schools, if I understand it correctly, or my experientially, um, don't have those same resources. So I think that that's where um, the, the crux of the issue really, really lies. So you're t you say that resources are really important. And I, and I think that they are, of course. Um, and Stacey Ann had said, you know, I really wish I had that you know, 50,000 or whatever to put my kid in a school that, you know, goes to, I don't know, you know, some kind of fabulous um, uh, place where they have conversations about gender and race and there's power and there's activism and, you know, there, there are schools that, that claim to do that. Most of those private schools are, are white too. Um, but I but I to one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but I really am of the mind and I experienced this um, with my own son and have had this conversation with my husband who's white that I think that being around a diverse student body really encourage you, encourages a mind to develop in a way that keeps them open to, to a different way of learning. Yeah. So, th so that it's maybe not just about resources. So probably the most significant memory I have in, in my lifetime is um, I was in eighth grade and my mother is like, okay, you got into all these public schools, or you're gonna get into all these public schools, like, but maybe, maybe you won't. Like, maybe you won't get into LaGuardia High School for acting, and what are you gonna do then? Like, why don't we just apply to some private schools, just in case? And so I did, and I got into all of them, like all of the um, elite private schools, 
And then um, when it came down to making a decision, I got into LaGuardia and I said, great, I'm going to LaGuardia. And my mother sat me down and she said, no, you're going to go to one of the private schools. And I threw like a weeks long tantrum. And I was like, I want to be with my friends. Like, I don't even know these white people. Like, they're all so rich. Like, I don't understand. And she's like, that's precisely why you're going, because you're black. And I'll never forget it. It was, also, it was the first time that I got um, that that projection was made onto me, but also like the first genuinely real conversation about race like, and the consequences of that I had with my mother. Um, and in hindsight, I think that I was really mourning the loss of, of diversity um, and integration because I had that in, in middle school. Um, and I didn't have it in high school. And like, you know, there's good things about private school, obviously. I got to go to a good college and like, I'm, have a good job now and whatever. But um, whatever. I really. Good job, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> I, really did, uh, I really did suffer that loss. That, that I think it's a real, yeah, sucked. I think that's a real thing. What were you gonna say, Wade? I think to her mother's point, right, is that like, we all say these really beautiful things about going to diverse schools is, cognitive diversity, innovation of thought, and all these things. But when it comes down to it, when people want their kids to have a quality education, and the idea, quality education comes from predominantly white schools, right? So um, I think that we just are lying to our, ourselves. Like, I do a diversity and inclusion training for corporations, and the idea is that we want all these great things and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, people always choose to go with what they, they, they think is the most profitable, Right, where that their kid can get the best education and then go to go go to the best college because on college ap applications they don't really care about you know that you went to a diverse school like that's not a question, right? Um, because all they really care about is your test scores. You know, I was watching MHP this last weekend and she said that we live in a testocracy, right? And we do, right? Like so that's that show. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's that, for those of you who don't know the shorthand of MHP. <laughs> <laughs> so like that's really what the cause of it is, is that like we all say these really nice things, but at the end of the day, we will default to where we think our kids will get the best education from, and then we will continually isolate other kids that can't get, get into those schools. Okay, well, I don't want to say any nice things, and I don't want any of you all to say any nice things. I mean, I, that's pr part of the, the point of the conversation is to say the not nice things, yeah. um, because unless we keep doing that again and again and again, it's going to continue to be exactly what you're talking about. The other thing that interests me, um, Hamilton, and then I'll open it up, when you have a kid, when you talk about um, these diff you know, sort of differences, disadvantages, resources, um, when you, your kid was here in public school, was he at a, a predominantly black or diverse or? It was actually quite diverse. I was actually impressed. And it, was, um, it seemed like it, they made it their duty to make it diverse, um, which felt genuine. But there was still the bureaucracy, and there's still the policy, as you said, you know, Wade? And that, that then makes the, these great ideals, which are like, you know, save the world, but in, 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 in applying, it's the total opposite. And that's pretty, uh, it could be traumatic depending on how you yeah. um, address it, you know? But, you know, my son's situation with being premature and... Um, him getting accepted into the school, but he went to, um, he was in the special ed program. But after like a three month assessment, three, six month assessment, they wanted to continue to keep him in special ed. And then after a year, we had to fight to, for them not to put him into special ed. Because, but special ed would, would benefit their policy. Right. So it's like, I mean, the idea was all great, but in applying it, Humanity here, ideal here. And it's like, really? Yeah. Okay, we have two mics. Please step to the mic if you have a question. Starting now. <laughs> this is Stampede. <laughs> me really nervous. Uh, hi, guys. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, just a quick question. I want to know what you guys feel about um, the programs like the fellowship and the collaborative uh, with the New York Department of Education to help um, populate the schools with teachers, the new teachers, and how usually it's uh, in schools that are in higher need. Um, so yeah, just your opinion on that. Thanks. 
Can you talk about, just outline the, the, the program? So just uh, your Again, opinion. These are not experts. Yeah. So, uh, so the New York Collaborative Teaching Collaborative Fellowship or programs that are eight months or two months that help train new teachers, usually it's either uh, new graduates or career, changing, uh, career changers uh, that want to teach, and usually it's to populate uh, New York public schools that are hard to populate with good teachers. So it's inexperienced teachers going into uh, teaching. I don't know if that's a better understanding. That sounds scary. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds scary to, to me from a couple of different things, right? Is that um, from a cultural competency standpoint, right? So like th th there does need to be a certain level of cultural education that happens. So I taught at a school called Harvey Milk High School. Um, it's, um, a, it's one of the only schools for, for gay and lesbian kids. And I won't lie, I was ignorant when I started working there. Um, like I could teach, right? But I wasn't very culturally competent. I remember um, there was this kid I had that on Mondays and Fridays, he was really a bad kid, you know, for lack of a better word. And Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, he was great. And I was like, what's going on with this young person? Come to find out he wasn't eating on weekends. So it made perfect sense, right? That why on Mondays and Fridays, because food, you can't focus if on Monday you haven't eaten yet and it's not lunchtime. And on Friday, you're worried about being hungry on the, on, on the weekend, but no one trained me, right, to prepare me for what, what the lived experiences and what the lives of these actual kids had. Right? And if that's not happening, it doesn't matter the, the quality of a teacher that actual person is, it's actually, are they showing up with some other skills that a diversity helps for the, that they can have the cultural understanding of what the, the lives of these kids are like when they're not in the classrooms. I would love to also hear just, I mean, they don't have any questions, but comments from parents if they're here or educators who are here. I mean, I think that that conversation, such as it was with um, the white parent I had at that school where my son used to go, where she was like, yeah, that doesn't really occur to me. Um, and it just, for me, it's like, how does that not occur to you? How? how? Um, but I'd love to hear from, I mean, I know that's hard to say, but, but how, how that changes or if it can change. Um, so I live in bed -Stuy. I moved there four years ago with like lots of other white people. <laughs> and um, so I have a three-year-old and a five-year-old um, and a group of parents who are middle-class white people have come together to think about public schools in the area because we believe that everybody deserves good education. Everybody should go to be able to go to school where they live and District 16 has some of the most um, the lowest performing schools in New York, and that's not okay. So um, there's obviously a personal incentive, but I believe that there's a, there's, um, we're not just in it for ourselves. Um, and I think that there's two things. I think part of what the Black Lives Matter movement and Ferguson has made me realize is that I don't know what, as a white person, I don't know what my white privilege is. You know, I, that's, that's part of it, right? It's ignorance. It's about not knowing the benefits that I have because I'm white. It's about not knowing that black people are profiled by the police because I'm not seeing it. It's like that mom. She doesn't see it, you know, because it's not been part of her experience. So I guess as a parent in bed -Stuy, I'm wondering, I feel like I walk into a room and what's seen is a gentrifier. It's what, it's not, and that's, personally, that's not the position that I'm coming from, you know? So how do we get over that first hurdle of like, I'm a white person, and I feel like there's a lot of judgment based on just that. Like, I'm here, I moved here four years ago, along with all the other gentrifying white people, and, you know, good or bad or whatever that means. Like, my question is, how do we, as a community, because I feel like I'm part of the Bedstock community now. I live here, I'm raising my kids here. You know, we're in the Block Association. I want, to, I want to live there. How do we get over that first hurdle and talk about schools and make them someplace we all want to send our kids, you know? Um, well, it sounds like you're doing a really good job because you're involved with your community, right? Like, I think that's sort of the, the main issue is that if you can, if you are a gentrifier and you can recognize yourself as a gentrifier, um, but also want to be a part of a community as opposed to a person living in like 
just living in the community, you know, or living in the space, not, you know, not the community, um, then that creates and fosters discord between existing residents and people moving in. Um, but if you, what I would say, I mean, it, my like personal advice to you would be to like go out to your like white brothers and sisters who are also gentrifying the community um, and have like frank open conversations about like your like racial location, your like class location um, and what you can do in order to like become part of the community as opposed to people living in the space. Does that make sense? Um, so I, it, when we, to like bring it back to personal responsibility, I would say that like, yeah, like that's your personal responsibility to like convince other white people that integration matters. I, I, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say what's really cool is when you stepped up to the microphone, you acknowledged all of that. And if you go to the neighborhood and you acknowledge that with the, with the I'm gonna use a little slang vernacular, I'm feeling comfortable. Um, <laughs> and address the, the cats on the corner and the sisters on the block in that, with, with, that, with that presence, which is beyond race, which is beyond class, which is beyond uh, borders, that's gonna translate as humanitarian, not an ideal. That's what's gonna be the, the starting point of the community growing as, as a unified organism, opposed to the white people's coming here. I would also add though, you know? that that is really just the beginning. Um, and that there is, I mean, I like the idea of the humanitarian approach, and that it, but, I, but I don't think that it, it is beyond race or class. I do think that there is some time that needs to be spent sitting in that privilege and feeling really lousy about it. And that, you know, you had said earlier, I, I'm here with other white folks, I've been here, you know, good or bad. Well, some people are gonna say bad. Um, and that's just part of it. But that's the first part of it. Um, and I think that that kind of self-awareness of, okay, that's gonna be the pushback. Then we can go from there. I think also, um, like you mentioned in the beginning that you're a part of association, make sure that that blog association is diverse. Like, like make it sure that it's intentional because if you're the only one seated at the table, it's, it's gonna become an echo chamber, right? The next thing I would say, I, I would also educate yourself on why people have such a problem with gentrification, right? And be a part of that conversation. And, and then also, as people talked about, like figure out what the people who used to live there, where they are. Like what can, what can you do to benefit them? Because in a way, like you did show up and the neighborhood's totally different than before you got here. Like understand why, you know, like again, like there's, there was something that existed before you got there. Find out what that was and what's happening to those people. Because, because again, like if, if you don't, you're basically showing up like the mom and say, well, it didn't matter to me, right? Because like, you know, my friend Adarna Moore, he always says that we can easily name whose people are standing on our neck, but can we name whose necks our feet are standing on, right? So like you gotta find out whose neck are your feet on. Also voting, like in local elections, like just vote. I mean, for de Blasio, there was like a record low um, voting turnout and that, that, you know, I mean, I would argue, I mean, I, I was a de Blasio supporter, so whatever, I, I was happy, but like, that's bad. Like, it's bad if we don't vote in local elections. Like on the macro level, like, you know, voting for, pre for president and is great, but like, I think I would argue that voting in, in your local elections is far more important um, at the end of the day. This mic is very high up. Um, I think it's off also, whatever. Um, my name is Maya. I am a current New York City public high school student. I go to Hunter College High School, hello, um, which is one of the specialized high schools in New York City. Um, and I think that specialized high schools pose a really unique problem to the conversation about diversity because they're based solely on a test or at least for my high school. Um, and a lot of people argue that because of that is the reason why in most of these places, there's less than 10% um, black and Latino students as part of the student population. And it's not just students, it's also, at my school we have two black teachers. Um, so I don't really have a question, just commentary on like that unique state of specialized schools in New York City. And also the fact that they're not 
zoned. So it's not based on a neighborhood per se. It's all, it's kids coming from all over the five boroughs to go to these schools. Um, my school is on the Upper East Side. Um, and also I think other schools, like if you look at um, MLK and LaGuardia, which are on 60 something street in Amsterdam, and you look at the racial populations of those schools, one school is predominantly white, one school is predominantly black, and they're across the street from each mm -hmm. other, right? And like the test scores, when you look at this, like test scores and the ratings for these schools, they're like, there's a vast difference. Um, yeah, so I guess wondering like what your thoughts are on like specialized schools and sort of like the meaning like behind a test score because obviously a test score is not just a test score and like a lot of different factors like race and class go into what make up that um, level. Um, yeah, well from, so just to give folks background if you're not all from here, um, the Hunter High School test occurs in seventh grade. Um, sixth grade? Sixth grade, sixth grade, okay, it's been a while. Um, <laughs> And what happens is, at least in my experience, is that um, teachers identify students who they think might be um, eligible, at least this is what happened in my school. Um, and then also there are parents who know about the school, um, so you have to have um, like pre-existing knowledge about the, this specialized school. Um, but if not, this is what happened in my school. Um, teachers cherry-picked kids to take the test because there's only a certain amount of spots um, each school gets to send kids to Hunter. Uh, and all of the kids they chose to take the test at my school, my middle school, which was, like I said before, 15% white maybe, were all white. Um, and I don't know if they decided solely based on test scores, um, like standardized test scores, uh, if that's the reason, it, it, like to, to pick those kids um, to take this test. Uh, but obviously the power brokers who are in this case teachers um, making these decisions, uh, I think have a lot to do with why these schools end up being um, as segregated as they are. Also, um, you know, testing sucks. <laughs> yeah, and as I said earlier, and is like really racist or whatever. And as I said earlier, we <laughs> live in a testocracy, right? Like where testing becomes the only indicator of potential, of drive, mm -hmm. of influence, of all those things. But tests actually can't measure that, mm -hmm. right? Um, they 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 just can't, right? I went to a school where I actually had to share books, so there's no way I'm going to do as good on a test as someone else, right? right? So is is the stage equal, or do I have more barriers to jump over to? to do as well on a specific test? Right. Probably not, right? right. If, if I come from a, from a neighborhood where there's other things that, that happen, right? So um, let's, let's say also I'm a trans young person, right? And I'm being bullied in school. And I normally have, most kids have, you know, 100% of their resources to, to give. But if 20% of those are worried about me being bullied, I only have 80% left left over and then maybe I don't eat every day so that's you know it's another percentage so if everyone is not showing up to the test with the same amount of resources there's a lack of a chance I'm going to do just as good on there and also as she said tests are biased like I took a test when I, when I was young that said saucer is the cup as plated as something else I didn't know what a saucer was I grew up really poor like I was like what the hell is that right so <laughs> that really matters and when I hear about like tests dictating it just I just get sad you know, mm -hmm. just to think that we're measuring kids off of tests. And in places like Louisiana, third grade test scores dictate the number of prison beds, right? So like, wow, like these, these tests are really great. And you know, yeah. What, can I say one? Sure, yeah. I just wanted to say what you said about like diversity of minds. Um, so like, I think like the real like basis of that is like if, we're, if I'm in a classroom, we're talking about slavery. If I'm in a classroom, we're talking about the civil rights movement. If I'm in a classroom, we're reading Black Boy by Richard Wright and there's no one there to make a statement when like something racist is said or something prejudiced is said or something biased is said, it won't really be addressed. You know, the teacher's white, all the kids are white or Asian, like no one's there, they don't, there's no, no voice. It's not the responsibility. Yeah. Right, the problem right. is the one. assumption that the, the person to make the statement would have to be a black person. Yeah. I mean, ideally, everybody would say, make the statement that's racist. Right. right, I mean, yes, of course, but like kids who are like 
I don't know, 12, 13 white kids, people who haven't really been like taught about like privilege or oppression because those resources just aren't part of their education growing up. Like that's that a really the real problem, uncomfortable right? yeah. situation, yeah. Like yeah. they're trying to take certain parts of slavery out of textbooks now, like, you know, it's crazy, crazy. Thank, thank God I'm old. Thank you, Ma. <laughs> What'd you say? I say, thank God I'm old, <laughs> you know? <laughs> For once being old school, okay. Hi, um, I, my heart is beating really fast and I think it's a good thing. Um, and I think it's good that we're having this conversa conversation. I'm happy to be here and I'm thankful for your comments because I too live in bed -Stuy. And I've been feeling, I'm uh, a child of Nigerian um, immigrants, grew up in Brooklyn and it's been tense in New York and I know people have been feeling it and I've talked about it in separate circles and primarily in like very, you know, close clusters, but not necessarily in public. And it's something that it's palpable, I feel it. I feel it walking down the street. Because I feel like the idea, in broad terms, the idea is that white equals money equals right, and black or a Latino or whatever is less than. And that's just like a, and it just happens to be in this country. What I've, I just finished traveling outside of the, outside of the country and I realized that gentrification is happening all over the, all over the world. Um, it's primarily based on money, but in, in this particular place, it's how it's highlighted is by color and it's, it's, it, it makes it very tense. And so I'm just saying that because I'm just happy to be here and I'm, I'm thankful to talk about it um, and thank you guys for talking about it. And um, as someone who grew up in the New York City public school system, um, we're talking about diversity and I've technically been in schools that were diverse, but because I was in gifted classes, I was one of maybe the only one or one of two people of color in general. Um, and so we talk about schools being diverse, but when you're in a class as a person of color and you're the only white person, I mean the only, only person of color in a, in a group of um, you know, white students, how are we you know, talking about diversity? Because once you're kind of segregated into the gifted program or whatever, you're kind of you know, cornered to the section where you're not really integrating, you're not really looked um, you're not really, yeah, integrating with people in your school. Um, and I also wanted to say something about this conversation about, um, I feel like the focus has been a lot about like, how do we bring white people along onto integrating schools or including people? And I, I'm personally, I'm at a point where I'm kind of tired about focusing on what white people think or when are they gonna accept or when are they gonna see? I personally would like to, and if people have any comments on the panel, I personally would like to see people of color um, kind of just focus on, I don't know, on getting their communities right. I feel like particularly with Bed-Stuy, it's like, why is it that houses only have value when somebody deems it? And it's usually because a white person or white people or society, however you want to kind of, I'm doing using broad terms, forgive me. Why is it that a house is deemed valuable because a white person has $1 million to, and not say it's not only white people, but um, I just, I, I would love for people of color to, uh, to know our value, to have, to have a knowledge of the value of our spaces, of our communities. Um, and I think that will, I don't know how I, that's a longer discussion, but I just, that is my hope. My hope is I'm, I'm tired of expending energy on trying to bring others along, and I just want people, you know, the communities of, of people of color to kind of rally and like figure out how do we, how do we, how do we, how do we, I don't know, how do we, how do we find our worth? How do we, um, if we do know our worth, how do we kind of broadcast that and really like live in that because I feel like that is that for me is an issue um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts about that but it's thank I, you, thank you. I, yeah. I, I love what you just said and like that what you that needs to be the way because we're both disenfranchised the blacks and the whites because we're not we're not working together for the same common goal. We all live. We all need to live. We all need to learn. We all. We all. Um, we all want to live a life and and have the fullest experience we can. And when race gets in the way of experience, it could help. But in this case, 
uh, X amount of years later, it's still, it's, it's still an issue. And, you know, we're addressing it, but we have offsprings who, who are feeling the remnants of this. And it's like when we all can, like how you, you go into the neighborhood and you move there, and you're aware of, of, of this reality in this country. This is a reality that's been, this has been a global reality. It hasn't changed since I went to Europe. It's still there, it's just refined. But in two, it is. But in two, we address it um, personally, you know, because you, you're speaking from a very personal level where you said, I'm tired of uh, what can I do? And when each of us say, what can I do, and see I as we, then I, I, I'm, I'm confident we're going to see the change that we need to see because it's going to be active. It's no longer going to be an idea or a policy, like you said, Wade, and it's going to be no, um, does it work in my best interest? Do I profit from it? You know, I profit if you profit. And until we have that idea and we, we're doing it to ourselves every day, we're looking in the mirror and saying, I'm profiting from loving myself. I'm going to do that for someone else, whether it's holding the door open, wh whatever it is. But I mean, I know that sounds like real philosophical, but I mean, I apply it in my everyday life and I'm happy. I, I mean, I agree. I absolutely agree fundamentally with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I also think, again, you're the one who's saying that, a, br a brown person, a black person who has experienced racial discrimination throughout your life. And, and, um, and so I, I think that for, and, and I, I, let me preface this by saying I've got white people, I've got white family, you know, but, but I think that going back to your comments, which is that take some time to think about what to say, just say what he just said. Right, instead of hearing it from a person of color, right? If that's truly what we're all about, right? Mm -hmm. Getting to this same place where we're trying to work with each other, then why don't I hear that from white people? Why does it always come from me or black people? To, to, totally, and that's the, but that's the work though. So all of us here need to be doing that work and, and don't worry about whether you're doing it or not, just be it. And that's the thing, we, we, could, we could theorize about it but being it is the theory. Being it is applying it. And it's like, how do you become it? You know, how, do you address it? Do you look at yourself and say, you know, it's like me being, oh man, uh, cause I'm black. I, I have all these disadvantages or, oh, the, the, the police is going to pull me over because I'm, cause I'm black or I fit this description. I don't fit any of those descriptions. I'm none of that. So I have no problems. And it's literally, it's been that simple for me. Um, if I look in retrospect to my life growing up and growing up in the 80s and seeing you know, my, my, my community and my home being infected by crack and by AIDS and seeing my parents using it and seeing these, these transitions but also seeing that um, how do I take these hard experiences and instead of pointing the finger at another group of people for, what, for whatever I perceive they may have done or haven't done, why don't I accept the experience and accept how can I grow from it? How can I use that? And it's painful. I'm not saying I've, every day it, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm on a cloud because some days I'm not, but it's something to work towards. And I just feel like when all of us are working towards that same common goal and asking those questions to ourselves and facing them and not trying to hide from them. I, I think I know what you're saying. I think I'm, I'm not sure. So what I'm hearing you say is that we all have to, have to get to a space of self-love, right? Correct. But I don't think that that excuses me from being able to name the forms of oppression that are oppressing me. So, um, because so I think it, as you were talking, I was thinking about this song by Erica Badu called Bag Lady, right? And the idea of, of that song is that I'm not going to keep putting stuff in my bag that you've given to me, yeah. right? Um, and and I, th I think about that song a lot, all the time, right? So how do we put down that load? Because others, because, you know, no, no matter how, how much I love myself, when I walk out of this, this door, some, there is some real consequences to me showing up in this world as black. You know, and I live on the Upper East Side. I got a good job. I got these fancy suits on, but that don't mean shit. You real know, talk. if yeah. if we're being real, right? Real talk. So, so the work that I have to do is 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 to love me, and somebody else has to do their own work, right? Mm -hmm. And I still get to name that. Yeah, right? totally. Like, I yeah. still get to get yeah. to be able to say that 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 X, Y, and Z is happening, and you're responsible for that. I, I'm not blaming anybody, no. right? But I'm saying that, that this is what's happening and somebody else needs to make me whole, right? So if like, what's interesting about like this idea of like, um, I'm gonna use this really controversial word, like reparations, right? Like 
if if tomorrow I get hit by a taxi cab, right, and I can't go to work, I get to sue that taxi cab company to make me whole financially and everything else, right? So if if racism impacts me, right, in in multiple ways, I should be able to get compensated for that, right? I should not, because that's the way that this country works all the time, mm -hmm. right? Like, my mother got, got hit by someone, she was out of work, they paid her while she was out of work, like, so what? So, like, again, like, so, so like, somebody needs to make me whole, mm -hmm. and they need to also fix the policies around that and answer to that, and, and I think, to your point, like, we have to walk through fear, like, we're living in so much fear around here, like, if you think about Donald Trump, his whole idea is just fear. Like, how can we get people more and more afraid, right, to, to see you as the other? And, and that's what's, what's really happening here. I think, we just have, we, I think we just have time for one, or, one more question, and then you all can um, ask. And I know you worker. from somewhere. Go ahead. So this question is for all of the panelists. Um, I think that all of you guys seem to have articulated that the premise of diversity adds value to growing up as a student. And so there's a school um, in the Heights that is a gentrifying neighborhood. And this particular principal, don't quote me on this, reporters, uh, has been very conscious about who is in her school. And so she has done, again, don't quote me on this, but certain percentages, right? A percentage of students have parents who are incarcerated. A certain percentage of students are dual language. A certain percentage of students are from the, you know, the radius, the zone, and a certain percentage of students are from the choice district, right? This is to create a diverse learning environment. And if you go into the school, you really will see a diverse learning environment. Spanish speakers and um, young white children and young brown children, all types of different children. So I guess my question to you, and this is the question she struggles with right now, is what is integration? Because diversity or getting that layout um, for a lot of principals is a priority, but really where the work begins. And so I'd like to hear from each of you what integration and what that work means for teachers and for the school community and for kids, because um, without going on too long, at, at the pre-K level, she sees who's sitting together at lunch. Right? And at that level, you're talking about who has a similar lunch bag, who's eating the similar foods, who's speaking the similar languages. But um, as an educator and somebody who cares deeply about this and wrestles with this daily um, from a policy perspective, but also from a p place in my heart, what do you guys think integration is? What does it mean? What should it mean for our city and in our school systems? Thank you. So let's take, keep our um, answers really succinct because we just this is our last question. Um, so I guess to me, on a, on a sort of basic level, integration is socioeconomic. It's just like, and racial. So it's, and that's it. And that, uh, I think that it's elementary and that it really falls upon the educators to, so to, to socially engineer situations um, that can foster to, like a, a, harmo a more harmonious um, diversity. So yeah, you might have kids that are sitting together at lunch, but what happens if the teacher comes over and says like, oh, hey, like, why don't you sit with you and whatever. I don't know. I'm not an educator. But like, surely there are tools to give teachers to help create that more harmonious integration that we're looking for, right? I mean, and we can't, I, I really do believe that it's elementary, right? That like, um, that we can't dismantle white supremacy and, unless we do it from like a very young, very young age. And the only place that that can really happen is in, is in schools. I mean, you look at um, the campus uh, activism that's gone, been going on across the country, in particular at Princeton with the Woodrow Wilson building and, um, and, and also in Missouri. And, and what I have been disappointed in is the lack of response from educators to help facilitate um, an ongoing conversation. They either just sort of be like, I'm out, like I'm done, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna give into this, or you know, have some other you know, response that's not helpful. But, th but as educators, that's sort of the job. I, w I would say the, um, that diversity is like the people, but the inclusion or the integration part is actually a shared power, right? Mm -hmm. That you can have as many people as you want who look a different way, act a different way, talk a different way, blah, blah, blah. But if they actually don't have access to power or included in, in the conversation, then there's actually no integration, right? And if the kids can't look around the school and actually see themselves reflected in the teachers and the staff, then it's not in integrated. Mm -hmm. And just from what both of them said, um, it's just 
the way I see it is just diversity, but harmonious, where everyone, everyone's benefiting from it. Because when everyone doesn't benefit, then it's just imbalanced. Thank you all for coming. Um, here's to continuing this conversation, and, uh, and please be, keep in mind what we have talked about and, um, and talk with each other and your families and your children, and keep listening. Thank you to the panelists.